In this last part of the podcast, we'll have a look at the lambda calculus, because the lambda calculus is central to the understanding of functional programming. The lambda calculus uh, is actually a model of computation that was proposed uh, by the American logician and mathematician Alonzo Church back in 1936. And that same year, Alan Turing showed that the lambda calculus has the same expressive power as the Turing machine model. Today, the lambda calculus is important uh, because it's the main theoretical underpinning of functional programming languages and their implementations, and very often, if we want to devise, uh, say, a type system uh, for um, for a functional programming language, we will first look at how that type system would uh, would appear in the lambda calculus. So the lambda calculus is very important uh, for this endeavor. First, let's have a look at the syntax of the lambda calculus. It really is quite simple. In the lambda calculus, expressions have the abstract syntax um, where you have variables. We let x range over those. We have lambda abstraction, lambda x dot e1, and we have application. And those are really the only constructs we have in the lambda calculus. We can use parentheses whenever needed, um, but really this is all we have. The intention is that in an abstraction lambda x dot e1, um, we think of the abstraction as a function and its formal parameters x and its body is e and the scope of x the scope of x is all of e1 and we can then introduce parentheses to delimit the scope if we need to uh, in an application e1 e2 the function e1 is to be applied to the argument e2 so um, really the lambda calculus has all we need to express computable functions we can express functions as abstraction, and we can express function application as well as application. So that's all we have, and that's all we need. Because we have a notion of lambda abstraction in the lambda calculus, it also means that uh, variables can be bound in a lambda abstraction. Lambda x e one x is bound in e one. So to capture this notion of bound variables, we are going to introduce. Uh, a notion of the set of bound variables in a lambda expression. And the set of bound variables are the set of variables that are mentioned in a lambda binding. What is the set of bound variables in a lambda expression x? Well, there aren't any, so the set is empty. What are the set of variables in an application e1, e2? Well, they're the um, bound variables in e1 together with the bound variables in e2, so it's the union of these sets. Now, the interesting case is that of um, lambda abstraction. What are the bound variables in lambda x e1? Well, x is definitely bound, but there may be more bound variables inside the body. So we take the union of the set consisting of x with the set of bound variables in e1. Likewise, there's a notion of free variables. And what are the free variables in a lambda expression? Well, again, we can define this in a syntax-directed fashion. The set of free variables in a lambda expression x is just a set x. The set of free variables in a lambda expression, which is an application e1, e2, well, is the union of the set of free variables in e1 and the set of free variables in e2. Now, the interesting case is, again, that of abstraction. The set of free variables for lambda x e1. Well, that's the set of free variables in e1, except x is not free because it's mentioned uh, in the abstraction, so we have to subtract that. This is set difference. It would be nice if we could say that a variable was free if, if it was not bound, but actually the same variable can be both free and bound within the same expression. And here's a simple example that shows why this is the case. Lambda x dot x x applied to x. Well, if we look at this sub-expression, x is bound. If we look at this sub-expression, x is free. And the reason why x is free here is that the scope 
of this x only extends to this parenthesis. So x is free and bound within the big expression. Is that a problem? Well, not really. And that's because a bound variable is just a placeholder. So all we need to do is rename the bound x in this expression. Rename it to y, and then we get lambda y dot y y x, and the confusion has gone. And in general, we'll write e1 is alpha convertible to e2 if we can obtain e1 from e2 by renaming some bound variables in e2. And we'll say then that e1 and e2 are alpha convertible. So um, sometimes we'll say that we alpha convert some expression to another, and that means that we're renaming some bound names. All this now allows us to define the notion of substitution of variables. And um, let's do uh, let's do that now. Um, e1, where x substitutes e2, is uh, defined as follows. Suppose we have an application. What does it mean that x su is substituted by e2? Well, it means that we substitute x by e2 in e prime, and we also substitute x by e2 in e double prime. Now that's the case for application. In the case of a variable, a simple variable y, what does it mean to substitute x by e2? Well, the result can be y, and that's the case if y and x are not the same variable because there's nothing to substitute. But if y and x are the same variable, then, of course, we replace x by e2, and we get e2 if y is equal to x. Now the, now, the more complicated case is that of an abstraction. What happens if we substitute within an abstraction? Um, if we want to replace x by e2, well, remember that we're substituting the free occurrences of x inside our abstraction. Now, if y and x are the same variable here, if y is equal to x, then nothing happens because we're substituting free occurrences of x within here, but there are no free occurrences of x. So then we just get that. Now, if x and y are not the same variable, then if there is no confusion, if y is not mentioned in E2, there can be no confusion, so we simply substitute within the body. But if y is different from x, and y is indeed mentioned in here, if we naively substitute, we might we would get a confusion that we would confuse this y with y's that appear in here, and they're not the same y. So what we need to do is to rename the bound variable. So that's what we do here. Z is a fresh variable, and we introduce a new fresh variable. When I say fresh, I mean that Z is different from X and is different from Y. It does not appear in E2. It does not appear in the abstraction. So we, instead of writing lambda Y, we now write lambda Z. And everywhere we had a Y, we now write Z in here. And then we can perform the substitution. Note that this is also substitution. So whenever this case happens, uh, there are actually two substitutions going on. But that's how we substitute variables. And there's this bookkeeping exercise that may be a bit complicated to think about. Um, but once we have substitution in place, we can define the semantics of the lambda calculus.
and that's just call by name. So that's what beta reduction really is. It's the parameter mechanism call by name. Syntactic substitution of the actual parameter for the formal parameter. There are two more reduction rules. One says that if we have an application and uh, the first part of the application reduces the whole part, the whole application reduces, and the other one says that if we have an application, the second part of the application reduces, well, so does the entire uh, application. So we can perform reduction in any subterm of an application, but there's no rule that says that we can reduce underneath an abstraction. There are no rules for that, so we cannot reduce underneath an abstraction. And those are the only reduction rules we have. Beta reduction plus the two rules on this uh, slide. Let's have an example to see what's going on. Here's a lambda expression. Lambda x dot lambda x dot y x uh, and lambda y dot y dot sorry, lambda z dot z. And uh, let's try to reduce that. Uh, the, the brackets show that uh, we can reduce here. This is uh, an application. We can use beta reduction and we get that. We have uh, replaced y by lambda set dot set. So we got that. And we can reduce that again using beta reduction. And that's what we get. And now we can use beta reduction on the term here. What do we get? We get lambda x, lambda set dot set x, and since we don't have reduction under an abstraction, we can do no more. We have terminated. Here's another example reduction that shows uh, the need for being very careful when it comes to renaming bound variables. The need for alpha substitution, oh sorry, alpha equivalence. Here is lambda y dot lambda x dot lambda x y applied to lambda y y x. Let's naively substitute lambda y dot y x for y over here and then we get lambda x x lambda y dot y x and the problem is that there is a free x in one part of the expression and a bound x in another part of the expression, we get a name clash. The two x's are confused. What do we do about that? Ah, we rename one x. We call it z instead. So instead of lambda x dot x y, we'll call it lambda z dot z y. And if we do that, we can substitute quite nicely. So um, that's another example reduction. What's this all got to do with Haskell, you might ask? Well, it's got a lot to do with Haskell. Uh, Haskell is just the lambda calculus, but the simple lambda calculus is inconvenient. It's much smaller than uh, any actual programming language. It's not a programming language. It's a programming model, but if we want a programming language, we need more features. The way to achieve that is to introduce a set of constants that we can think of as library functions, and then the formation rules for the abstract syntax will be extended with an expression also being a constant c. And then um, a functional programming language is just an applied lambda calculus with a very large library of constants. That's all. To get the semantics of the applied lambda calculus, we just add some reduction axioms for each constant. Suppose we want to say the natural numbers and addition, then the lambda constants would be a constant for each natural number and a constant called plus, and then we would have an axiom plus saying that plus is n1 and n2 reduces to n, where n is n1 plus n2. So that's all. Um, Haskell is just, in some sense, it's just syntactic, syntactic sugar for a very particular applied lambda calculus. Um, and you can see that the lambda calculus is actually the heart of Haskell because we have lambda expression in, ha in Haskell. Lambda expressions, lambda x dot e, they're written as backslash x arrow e. 
and x is the argument and e is the body of the lambda expression. So it's all in there. Uh, in scheme, we would write this as lambda x e. It's the same thing.